Last time Derby County won a league game at Craven Cottage was in 1969. They went on to win promotion as champions under a certain Brian Clough. Now Steve McLaren looks on course to follow in the great man's footsteps. In sharp contrast, the horror of consecutive relegations raises its ugly head again for Fulham, who start the day just five points above the drop zone. Captain Scott Parker was rested for the midweek defeat at Wolves, but returns today. Hugo Rodiega misses out with an ankle injury and is replaced by 20-year-old Corley Woodrow. After seven months out following a knee operation, George Thorne has picked up a thigh problem and is ruled out. In comes Omar Mascarell for Derby. Darren Bent and Tom Ince have scored 12 goals between them since signing on loan in January. Christie being forced back towards his own goal. Keogh has lost out to Bodorov. But that might go to Mascarell. What a tackle from Parker. And suddenly things opening up here for Fulham. It's Woodrow trying to set up Christensen. Still there, Christensen. Flying header over the bar from Sonnycliffe. It's the first genuine threat that Fulham have posed. And Sonnycliffe at the heart of it. Good defending from Derby here to prevent Christensen getting his shot on target. Tunnycliffe close to testing Lee Grant. Here's Forsyth for Derby. Given away cheaply by Mascarell. McCormack through the legs of Keogh. Beautiful ball. He's got options to his left. This is Tunnycliffe. Should have hit the target at the very least, Ryan Tunnycliffe. Fabulous ball from Ross McCormack. Look how he uh, embarrasses Keogh here. Perfect weight on the pass, and Tunnicliffe really should be doing much, much better with that opportunity. He's never scored for Fulham. And on that evidence, you can see why. Back for Parker. Far side, Staphylidis. It's a decent cross. Shot and forced to turn it behind. And he fired it in there, Staphylidis. Far from finding the head of Woodrow. Ruiz with this Fulham corner. Can they make it count this time? Headed away by Forsyth. Down as far as Tunnicliffe. Blocked by Keogh. Parker feeding Ruiz. Still plenty forward for the home side. Steps easily away from Mascarell. Brian Ruiz. And stabbed in. Bodorov. Nikolai Bodorov with his first ever goal in English football. And it's the black and white supporters of Fulham who cheer the opening goal of the afternoon. Fulham have been asking more questions. Ruiz made Mascarell look foolish there. His shot was charged down. How about that from improvised finish from the Bulgarian Bodorov? Almost a kung fu kick as he volleys it past a helpless Lee Grant. Ruiz kept his nerve forward by Stapilidis Mascarell now Hughes has lost out to Parker out muscled by the former England man who charges forward McCormack is free McCormack for Fulham and it's 2-0 Woodrow got the final touch it's brilliant counter-attack play from Fulham Derby undressed and Fulham lead 2-0 no great show of emotion on the face of Kit Simons but inside he will be purring. Parker just too strong for Hughes. And Derby looked vulnerable from here on in. McCormack didn't shoot. And Woodrow flicks it in as Derby were expecting the crack at goal from Fulham's leading scorer. Disguise ball in from McCormack. Flicked home by the youngster Corley Woodrow. And Fulham the strugglers lead the lead leaders by two goals to nil. Stapelidis. It's a cross that favours Fulham. It's dropped for Ruiz. Now Woodrow. Kavanagh. Parker. Woodrow. Parker. Parker with a chance. Oh, he's got the ball in. And McCormack denied by Forsyth. 
Fulham so close to what surely would be a killer third goal. Parker somehow squeezed the ball across. And Forsyth with a very timely and effective block as McCormack tried to screw it home from a tight angle. Keogh has to win it. In goes Bryson. Keogh, it's more like the sort of fight that Derby require. Ince, and he provides some magic. Oh, good stretch from Bettinelli. It was the deflection that the uh, shot took there of Tunnicliffe that caused Bettinelli to have to jump backwards here. It's the first save he's made, and we're in the 69th minute. Just can't pick a pass at the moment, Derby. Unable to go forward, unable to carve open this Fulham rear guard. who are so well drilled. Richards just having a nibble on it. Derby free kick. 19 minutes to go. One goal might be all that it requires to uh, turn the tide in this one. So Tomitz over the set piece. Buxton and Keogh amongst those in yellow in the box waiting. It's killed deeper than those two. Hendricks got the header in. And Bettinelli with the save. So that's as close as Derby have come today. Jeff Hendrick at the back post just trying to squeeze it into the tightest of gaps. Hendrick, he's done well. And he's found Ince. He's got space far side in the shape of Forsyth, closed down by Richards, back for Ince to strike! Well, it took a flick on its way through. Referee says it came off a Fulham player, that's why he's given a corner. Had there been nobody in the way here, it might well have brought Derby County a route back into this game. Fearsome pace on it, flicked off the shoulder of Bodorov, who knew nothing about it. Here's Hughes for Derby. It's all so tight through the middle. And that's long and hopeful downfield, and Grant stays at home, and McCormack is in here. So much time! Saved by Grant. Hopelessly exposed there, Derby. Just a ball hoof downfield. Buxton hasn't got the pace to get back. Grant stayed at home. In the end, it's the right decision. But McCormack will be disappointed that uh, he didn't test the goalkeeper more than he did. Dembele is away from Keogh, here's a chance to wrap it up, he hit the post, that close to 3-0. Still no league goal for Moussa Dembele, but surely now all three points for Fulham. Got the better of Grant there, and only the woodwork prevents Fulham from a 3-0 lead. Overall, we've been playing very, very well. It's just been isolated spells and, and poor decisions and um, some poor defending and not taking our chances. You know, these, these things have been costing us, but uh, you know, overall, our play has been, has been pretty good. Um, but today, we, we got it all together, and that's what you need to do at, at any level, really, but especially in this championship. You don't win football matches performing like that. And, um, you know, Fulham is a dangerous team. You know, the I can't believe the position that they're in should never be there with the players that they've got, and I think they showed that quality today, and that's what we said. Uh, this is a team that can beat anybody in the league on their day. Um, today was their day. It was a bad day at the office for us. Dust yourselves down and uh, go on Tuesday again. Hillsborough's not been a happy hunting ground for Middlesbrough down the years, but on current form, Ita Karanka's men will have fancied their chances, seeing as Sheffield Wednesday hadn't won here either since Boxing Day. Wednesday, who ended a seven-match winless streak with victory at Millwall in the week, carved out the game's first real opening as Will Keane headed over. With the Championship's best two defences on the same pitch, it was hardly surprising that clear-cut chances were hard to come by in the first half. Adam Forshaw lifted an effort wide before Wednesday defender Claude Dielna steadied himself but volleyed straight at the keeper. Stuart Gray's men are one of the few teams to win at the Riverside this season and were on course for a double when Kenneth Omaru handled inside the area. Just seven minutes into the second half, Atty Nuiu squeezed in the penalty to rack up his ninth of the campaign. With Borough still reeling from that setback, 
Wednesday hit them once more. Lewis McGugan's free kick flicked onto the post by Nuiu, and Keane was first on the scene to wreck the visitors' hopes of a turnaround. In fairness, Wednesday were full value for their win, as Middlesbrough suffered more disappointment for the second Saturday in succession. Patrick Bamford's tame header rather summed up their day. The first minute we were at him, we closed him, we forced errors, and we ruffled him a little bit. And then second half, I just thought we totally dominated the game, controlled the game. Um, we won more second balls, which allowed us to be more creative. And like I say, we, we caused a very good side uh, problems. I prefer to go home and uh, to think about uh, what happened today and uh, which uh, mistakes I, I made and uh, think about the, the future because today... The performance, the game, everything was uh, very bad. Blackburn expected a rough ride at the Gold Sands where Bournemouth needed to regain their momentum. Eddie Howe's men confronted by the prospect of slipping to three straight defeats for the first time all season. They did their best to put those thoughts to bed after Callum Wilson and Jan Kermigant caused problems and Mark Pugh couldn't hit the target. But he was a busy man, involved again in the 1-2 that got Charlie Daniels in behind the Rovers' back line. In the second half, Pugh continued to cut a groove down that left flank and his cross looked tailor-made for a finishing touch. But it was just too high for Wilson. Best perhaps for Bournemouth to aim for the head of Kermigant, the midfielder renowned for his aerial prowess. Jason Steele called into action that time and the Frenchman was only getting started. As Simon Francis crossed, Kermigant made himself another yard. The Cherries getting closer and the fans more frustrated, already aware the top two had slipped up as this game had kicked off half an hour late because of traffic problems. Harry Arter continued the mission to end the deadlock, but Blackburn would be the first team all season to stop Bournemouth from scoring on their own turf, putting them in a position to clinch the points right at the death. Tom Kearney had time to set his sights and was just a whisker away. Uh, probably final ball or a final decision could have been better in the final third but you know it's a game where we've worked the keeper uh, as I said we dominated and you have asked questions but uh, for some reason it hasn't quite fell for us and you know we haven't got the three points that we desperately wanted. I thought we contained them well tactically we, we did ever so well with our shape and our organisation and then could have won it at the death with TC's chance um, Tom Kearney's chance great opportunity for him and we were waiting for it to wrestle back in the back, back of the net It's been a stormy week on social media for Leeds. Not only did Russell Crowe tweet his interest in owning the club, but striker Billy Sharp was spotted agreeing with fans, suggesting that he should have started in Leeds' midweek defeat to Brighton. This was an even better way for him to respond, pouncing after a mix-up between Herelio Gomez and Akiti Anya. That midweek defeat had ended a run of three straight wins for the Whites, when Rudy Austin's stunner put Leeds two ahead here inside the opening 20 minutes. Ellen Road was confident that that blip was behind them. But Troy Deeney is a reliable source of Leeds' woes. His sixth goal in his last six games against them gave Watford real hope as the sides went into the break. And the turning point of the match came early in the second half. Austin in on goal, but unable to beat Gomez or Gabriele Angela on the goal line. That near miss cost the home side as Watford began to look more like themselves. From Dini's pass, Mattier Vidra levelled the match just before the hour mark. The goal only the striker's second since November. His confidence suddenly returned. Vidra began to lead the way for a revitalised Watford. Michael Silvestri having to deny the live wire check. And with nine minutes to go, and he was faster to the loose ball than Sol Bamba. Vidra completed the comeback. Watford are now up to third, one point behind Borough. Now there's something for Twitter to talk about. It's important win for us, but it's uh, nothing is definitely we are we are serious job in front of us. They're a good side, I have to say. You know, probably as good as you're going to get at this level going forward. You know, as, as regards as attacking sense, um, but we, we, you, you can't defend like that and expect you know to get a result. An eight-game winless run, Gary Rowett's worst as a manager. Mark Warburton brought Brentford to Brum, having battered Blackpool with a record 42 shots at goal. The Bees lost last season's top scorer Clayton Donaldson to Birmingham in the summer. He's not been quite so prolific at the higher level. Nonetheless, David Button alert to make the save. James Tarkovsky given the job of marking Donaldson, 
all going well until five minutes before half time. Paul Caddis's cross going in off the luckless defender. Brentford had won their last two, impressively despite Warburton's days as boss being numbered. Skipper Jonathan Douglas had their best first half crack at restoring parity. Blue's winless run snaked all the way back to early January. Caddis enjoying a fine game here, nearly adding a goal to his earlier assist. This was a much improved showing from the home team, a very flat one from the promotion chasing Bees. Donaldson teed up Damari Gray, who fired wildly over the crossbar. Gray's next effort was more in keeping with the teenager's excellent season, a shot arcing a fraction wide of a game-clinching second goal for Birmingham. The home team's perfect day tainted by a late sending off. Stephen Gleeson's lunge on Alex Pritchard, sufficient to draw a straight red card from referee Darren Bond. The bees beaten, but better from Birmingham. We knew we had to be tight, we knew we had to be strong defensively, uh, but we created lots on the break um, and really probably should have added to our goal tally. We our best today, had a lot of, lot of the ball, the ball entering the final third, but never really tested the keeper enough today. And, that's a little bit of care on our final pass, but uh, we'll learn from it. Ian Holloway was given the dreaded vote of confidence this week, despite increasing calls for him to be sacked. Tuesday's home defeat by Sheffield Wednesday cranked up the pressure ahead of the trip to Rotherham, but Martin Wolf had got just enough on the ball to give his side the edge in this battle for survival. The Lions started the day three points behind the Millers, who had a superior goal difference, but for Adam Collins' sharp reactions, Lee Gregory would have had them two up. A big turning point because within 90 seconds of the restart, they were pegged back. Jos Hoyveld in the firing line, first clearing straight to Danny Ward and then struggling to get out of the way. With nine defeats in 14 and the games running out, it's starting to look desperate for the London club. Following good work down the right from Diego Fabrini, he spotted Wolford unmarked at the far post, but the home side managed to repel the danger. They've just come through a testing set of fixtures against teams targeting promotion, so this was a big chance to boost their own survival prospects. Jack Hunt smashed the paintwork, with Lions keeper David Ford reacting well to deny Ward a second. By now, Millwall was struggling to cope with the pressure. After failing to deal with a corner, Hoyveld appeared to catch Kirk Broadfoot in the box. A lucky escape. But five minutes from the end came the killer blow, as Carry Arneson thumped in the winner to leave Holloway's men six points from safety. At the end of the day, I knew the job I wanted to do, and it's not going very well, I must admit that, but I'm not guaranteed anything, and I haven't guaranteed anything when I came here. Um, and at the minute, it's just not going, so we'll have to blame someone, and the manager normally gets the blame, so I'll take that. I'd rather then shout at me than the team, but it's very detrimental when you're trying to concentrate, but the players are professional. I had to lift them at half-time. They're feeling a little bit sorry for the self group, and... Uh... But obviously we got a quick goal when, when you have it off the post, off the line, perhaps a couple of penalties on another day given, um, but we got the goal. Just above the bottom three, back-to-back -back home wins have given Brighton fresh confidence and like opponents, Bolton, the breathing space of a six-point cushion. Ben Amos prevented Sam Bulldock from giving Albion the lead inside the first five minutes, as it turned out by far the best opening of the first half. Tim Ream with a test for David Stockdale from distance that the goalkeeper handled comfortably enough. While former England striker Emo Heskey made his biggest impression a long way outside the box with a stumbling challenge on Lewis Stunk more suited to the Six Nations. After the break, Brighton's January signing from Southwick, Berem Kyle had Amos at full stretch. The Israeli a key figure in the club's upturn. And there was more to worry Wanderers when Joe Bennett burst into the box. Amos off his line sharply, and Matt Mills blocking Craig McCow Smith's shot before Jao Teixeira's miss kick eventually let the home side off the hook. In a difficult run, Neil Lennon's men had just lost three in a row, a sequence that would be broken thanks to a moment of individual inspiration. From Josh Vella's pass, Zach Clough with a terrific turn, and the presence of mind to pass the ball coolly into the corner. That's six goals since the turn of the year for a teenager rapidly making a name for himself. Brighton pressed hard to salvage a point, but the template was set because Engelualo R found Bolton offering stubborn resistance and Rowan Ince lacked Clough's composure. Brighton's still sweating, though the gap from the bottom three remains the same. Bolton are a step closer to safety. I enjoyed the uh, last couple of minutes, I enjoyed the goal. 
But in between then, you could tell it was you know two teams who you know were edgy, you know, understandably so, considering the positions they both found themselves in. It was always going to be a, a tight affair, a difficult place to to come at, at any stage. Um, but it was going to be about moments to to change a game, and of course the lad Clough showed a, a wonderful moment to score. We got ourselves into some real good positions as well, and the keepers had to make some good saves. With Blackpool and Wigan 12 and nine points from safety before kick-off, there were plenty writing off both clubs' chances of survival before a ball had even been kicked in this basement battle. But Wigan were determined to make the most of the six-pointer and took the lead through Kimbo Kyung on the stroke of half-time. With the Latics on top from the outset, Blackpool became increasingly desperate, but Tony McMahon's melodramatic fall didn't fool referee Keith Stroud. The booking, the latest indignity for a side swiftly unravelling. The Tangerines' big chance came and went just after the hour mark. After Carson safe from Grant Hall, Emerson Boyce denied Tom Aldred what would have been a priceless equaliser. But Lee Clark admitted that Wigan were deserving winners. Harry Maguire's goal doubled the lead for Malky Mackay's side, who displayed grit and quality on a rotten surface at Bloomfield Road. James McLean confirmed Wigan's second win in 11. They just about stay in touch with those above them. Blackpool looked doomed, but they kept plugging away and did pull one back when Gary Medine scored his second for the club. Despite being 15 points from safety, with only 12 to play, it seems the Tangerines aren't about to throw in the towel just yet. It's not beyond me, because mathematically it says it isn't, but it's made it much more difficult than it was before the game. Uh, a hell of a lot more difficult. But while as the possibility mathematically to still do it, we've got to keep fighting. We knew it was going to be a tough game, it's a local derby, um, we're both fighting for the points obviously, Lee's a, a good experienced manager and I knew his team would be up for it um, and it, the pitch was, was particularly difficult as, as we knew it was going to be but um, I thought to a man we were terrific today. A first appearance of the season for Cardiff's owner Vincent Tan and a week where the club announced debts of £174 million. On the field at least things have been improving, five unbeaten as Wolves came calling and a bright start too but Owen Doyle's penalty appeals were quickly dismissed. The Irishman still searching for his first goal since his January move from Chesterfield and almost got lucky as his teasing cross deflected off Danny Bart. Wolves wouldn't be quiet for long, having racked up back-to-back -back wins, scoring eight without reply, they once again demonstrated their skills on the counter-attack, Benikafobe doing the hard part before Rajiv Van Lepara's cross dropped kindly for Bakary Sacco, who tucked away his fourth goal in three games. Down the other end, Thomas Kushak got his fist to Peter Whittingham's free kick and was no doubt relieved to see Aaron Gunnison's had a loop over. Whittingham's set pieces were a constant threat. In the second half, Kenwyn Jones was inches away from sending Wolves back to square one. They still needed the security of that second goal. A defensive mix-up gave a Fobe his big chance, but David Marshall spread himself to keep Cardiff in contention, whose hopes of staying unbeaten for the whole of February suffered a major blow when Whittingham went flying through Matt Doherty. Already booked, he knew what was coming. The first red card of his career left the Bluebirds a man light for the final 25 minutes, but his departure seemed to galvanise his team. Another free kick caused chaos in the box before Bruno Aquali Monga eventually blazed over. Wolves were made to sweat right to the very end. In the third minute of five added on, Cardiff almost got their break, but Jones's deflected header was cleared off the line by Richard Stearman as Wolves closed the gap on the top six to two points. Nottingham Forest looked the side most likely to make a late charge from the Championship's middle tier. Old boy Simon Cox spurned the chance to disrupt their progress at Reading before the side revitalised since Dougie Friedman took charge, seized control in the second half. Matty Fry with the first warning of what was to come, bringing the best out of Adam Federici. An awkward landing for the keeper, but perhaps just as painful was the sight of Ben Osborne's effort nestling in the top corner as Forrest took the first step towards a fifth win in six. Next, it was Fry at tormenting the Royals, who've had a forgettable February on their own soil, his fancy footwork leaving Steve Clark's men on the brink of a third successive home defeat. Next week's FA Cup quarter-final at Bradford's looming large in Reading's thoughts, but their league position remains a mild concern. Nathaniel Shalaber tried to spark a comeback before Gary Gardner killed the game in spectacular fashion. It's still a sizeable gap to the top six, but with this finishing and on this form, Forrest will think anything's possible. 
Yeah, I think we've been punished today. Uh, I thought first half we played really well. Uh, had a good control of the game. Missed a couple of really good chances that, that should be goals. Uh, and obviously, two great strikes for Forrest in the second half uh, make a difference. I felt we looked a lot more compact. Uh, we are attacking threat, which we've always got, uh, really come to the forefront in the last 20 minutes especially. And I think we were world ready winners in the end. The Valley saw the return of former manager and player Chris Powell, his first visit since being relieved of the top job last March. But this wasn't the homecoming the Huddersfield boss was hoping for. Johan Berg Goodmanson got Charlton off to a flyer. Huddersfield came to the capital having won two of their last three on the road. But Ishmael Miller's effort was as close as they came. Charlton took the game away from their former gaffer in the second half. Three minutes after the restart, Tony Watts claimed the first of two expertly taken goals. After 14 games without a win, Charlton now have three out of four. They dominated here. Laurie Wilson and Yoni Bayerns both threatening a third goal in quick succession. And there was to be one more for the home side. Watts with some tidy feet and an explosive finish as a ruthless Charlton made it a thoroughly unhappy return. For their club icon. It was second best really um, against a, a side who, you know, especially with their front two very lively, um, uh, Igor and uh, Tony Watts, and uh, you know we needed to deal with their, their threat, and um, we didn't do it. Today it was a full stadium in Charlton. It's not happened every day, and uh, it was uh, very important to us that the fans will go home with a good feeling, because I'm sure that uh, everyone enjoy because today we play fantastic, we play brilliant. The beat goes on. Crew Alexandra's fabled academy, famous throughout English football for its long list of past graduates. Drums keep pounding a rhythm to the brain. la da 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 -de. Over the past few years, the sales of Nick Powell to Manchester United, Ashley Westwood to Aston Villa, Luke Murphy to Leeds United have kept the production line going and they're still hard at it. This week, this crop beat Arsenal in the FA Youth Cup to set up a quarter-final clash with Manchester City on Monday night. We've got to keep doing it because, uh, like I say, it's, uh, it gets tougher. but. We'd love to look up rather than down in years to come. We still want to produce the players, we still want to sell those players, but we still want those players to help us get to a, another level, which they did with Dario. There's more of the players, past and present, and the coaches, you know, have had a, a significant part to play in their life. I think the most satisfying thing is, you know, that I've, been, I've been able to help people with their achievements. I think the philosophy has always been for him to, uh, to produce a, a, a a working environment like this where young players can blossom and grow and develop so all we do all I've done is taken it on over the last three or four years to continue it um, as I said he started with virtually nothing and uh, this is what he's built so we're just uh, delighted that the facilities as they are it's brilliant got to show you this this is a pride and joy of the whole place Final game of the season, 2013, entire first 11 came through the academy. So you signed on here when you were seven and you're now 23? 23, yeah. I want one thing you learn as a very wee kid that you still take on the pitch with you every single game now. So just go out there and express yourself, um, you know, individually and as a team as well and just be, be comfortable on the ball and and go out there and, and do what you do best. We're just very sensible in, in, in what we do. Um, we we uh, invest in our academy, so we have to use it. And in years to come, that might change. As I say, the, the, the football's changing. It's getting harder for clubs at this size to sustain the level that we're at. But uh, we're still ambitious. That's where we want to be. And um, whilst I'm here and ambitious myself, I try and push the club as far forward as I can. Must be a lovely feeling when it all comes together, that run of 22 points from 30 that kind of straddled Christmas and pulled mm. you out of the bottom four. Mm. I mean, that's what Crew Alexander is all about. It, it was hard, I have to say. It was um, a real tough period. As you said yourself, you touched on the spirit, how, how lively and spirited it is here. 
and I think that's got us through the difficult periods and did last season. We have to be realistic. Um, there will be some difficult seasons when we, we don't achieve what we want to achieve, but there will be hopefully some other seasons where we do, and uh, I think that's what you have to go with these days. So would Crew seniors be inspired by their kids? A run of one winning four had seen the Robins rocking. They thought they'd taken the lead here, though, an offside flag denying Swindon's Jordan Turnbull. In a hard-fought game, the Alex gave Paul Rahubka his full debut in goal. The veteran reacting well to parry Nathan Byrne from long range. League One's worst defence last season is the second leakiest this time. What has Rahubka let himself in for? He was a busy man in the second half, his palms next stung by Jonathan Abika. Even if goals were elusive, red cards weren't. Swindon's Jack Stevens shown a second yellow card for kicking the ball away. And referee Graham Salisbury wasn't finished there. Eight minutes into stoppage time and Crew's Alan Tate's second caution had him off too. On as even it finished, 10 versus 10. Both sides had chances and didn't take them, but uh, it was a, I thought it was a great game to watch. End to end and uh, both teams fully committed. And uh, that, that's what I want from my team. I know Mark's been getting that more often than we have, but um, they certainly know they've been in the game today. It's just a little bit of quality at the end and some great defending from both teams. Um, but, uh, you know, I can't ask for any more from the players today. Ahead of this game, Cottrell described Rochdale as dangerous opponents. Dale's Peter Vincenti backed up that notion as early as the ninth minute. But five minutes later, and against the run of play, Aaron Wilbraham went some way to allaying his manager's concerns by giving Bristol City the lead. Rochdale had lost three of their previous four matches, but had scored more goals on the road than anyone in the division. Vincenti was almost too desperate to better that statistic. It was proving not to be his day, however hard he tried. Early in the second half, he again found himself in sight of goal, only to be denied by the agility of former Rochdale keeper Frank Fielding. The leaders had done enough to avert the danger. We knew that we had to be good today defensively and tactically with that, so thankfully we were. The, the boys did everything they were asked today, just that we were on, on turnover in possession. We were a little bit anxious. Sky Blue skipper Jim O'Brien said this week the players are not departed boss Stephen Presley with the root cause of the team's shocking form. Caretakers Dave Hockaday and Neil McFarlane got the perfect response. Nine minutes in, Chris Stokes' first goal for the club. It was almost two months since Coventry last won a league game. MK Dons began the day in second place. We'd have got long odds on a start like this. Just 12 minutes played and it was 2-0. On loan Reading youngster Dominic Samuel now has four in five league matches. MK Dons took over 1,600 fans to the Rico. They've enjoyed the skills shown by former Coventry player Carl Baker. As he supplied Daniel Powell to cut the home team's lead to just a single goal. In the dying embers, the Dons even sent goalkeeper Ian McLaughlin forward to try and save the game. It wasn't to be. The first home win for the Sky Blue since October. The caretakers off to a terrific start. We haven't won at home for, for many months. And I think it was a nervy performance. There's been a lot going on this week. But it was going to take that kind of steel, determination, grit, whatever you call it, to, to, to get three points and really turn the corner at home. And as I said to a man, I thought they were fantastic. Well, I thought we deserved way more than what we got credit to Coventry. I thought they stuck to the guns really well. And we had a five minutes of madness where we conceded two silly goals. Other than that, other than actually the save that Ian made that led up to their first, they didn't have a shot on target after that, or a shot. Sheffield United's players wore black armbands as a mark of respect for David Shred Spencer, a much-loved lifelong fan who died suddenly during the week. And they started on the front foot at Trawley. Jamie Murphy's close-range effort only parried by Lewis Price before Michael Doyle put the loose ball over the bar. But it was the home side who opened the scoring just past the hour. Former Sheffield Wednesday defender Richard Wood taking great pleasure in meeting an Anthony Wordsworth free kick. Crawley have taken care of promotion chasing Preston and Swindon in recent weeks. But when Ryan Dixon pushed over Matt Doe nine minutes from time, 
Mark McNulty had the chance to extend the Blades' unbeaten league run to six games. It was a pressure penalty, but the club's top scorer kept his call, and with two home matches to come, Sheffield United remain in very good heart. I thought Crawley started the game well, but once we settled down, dominated the sort of last 30 minutes of the first half uh, and then most of the second half so to go 1-0 one, one behind it was a brilliant free kick that they took um, very disappointing to go 1-0 behind The departure of Darren Ferguson left academy manager Dave Robertson in caretaker charge of Peterborough for the visit of the FA Cup quarter finalists Seven minutes into the second half his side edged in front Gabriel Zakwani getting the final touch on John Taylor's free kick Just as the 90 minutes were up Peterborough were given the chance to make sure of the three points, even though there didn't appear to be much intent on the part of Bradford's Billy Knott. Michael Boswick stepped up to score his third goal of the season and get the post-Ferguson era off to a successful start. We just asked them to, to give us a level of performance that would make ourselves and the, and the supporters here at the Abak Stadium proud. Um, and I feel they've done that. And we said, as long as you do that, we feel that you'll get the result that you deserve. And listen, against a very strong Bradford side, um, I was over the moon with the performance. Oldham's first game since manager Lee Johnson left for Barnsley. Caretaker Dean Holden's side behind to Paul Huntington's header after 66 seconds. Another Paul, Scholes mentioned as a possible successor to Johnson. The lifelong Latix fan might think twice on this evidence, though, as Preston ran riot. Chris Humphrey hitting the bar. The respite, though, was short-lived. Daniel Johnson was on loan at Oldham earlier this season. Now he's thriving at Preston since he's moved from Aston Villa. Who could do with a goal scorer? His third in successive matches was taken emphatically. It's a Preston squad full of natural goal scorers, none more so than Joe Garner. This won't win any awards, but a classic case of right time, right place. That's 15 for the season. A welcome return too for Jermaine Beckford. An ear infection affecting his balance had him out of action for a month. Both his balance and ability to finish appeared in rude health here. Having him back gives North End real options for the run-in. Four goals away from home, um, coming to a team that obviously got caretaker in, in place now and it, you never know what to expect. So obviously all round, fantastic day for us in front of a, of a, a big following that we've brought here today. New Barnsley boss Lee Johnson couldn't have picked a more difficult first fixture than Gillingham if he tried. The home side unbeaten in their previous seven league games, but his new players responded really well and netted the only goal of the match 11 minutes into the second half. Stuart Nelson unable to hold a low shot from Ben Pearson and George Waring took great care in sticking away the loose ball. The Jills have been brilliant since Justin Edinburgh took over the reins, but they failed to take a couple of respectable chances to equalise. Gavin Hoyt's shot expertly kept out by Adam Davis, but Jermaine McGlashan was too high from the rebound. He had a chance to make amends for the miss late on, but fair play to Davis, and his save meant a great start for Johnson, but a first defeat for Edinburgh. Goal difference was all that was keeping Doncaster out of the top six. Andy Butler found the woodwork was all that was keeping him from giving Rovers a third-minute lead. Only 11 minutes had passed when Colchester were awarded a penalty for Reese Wabara's push on Chris Porter. Porter got up to take the penalty, but squandered the chance to score his fourth goal in eight games since joining the U's. Donny have found goals hard to come by at home this season, and like Butler 15 minutes earlier, Abdul Razak was denied by the woodwork. Rovers' first half persistence eventually paid off. Six minutes before the break, the Colchester defence failed to deal with Nathan Tyson's cross and Ender Stevens squeezed in his first goal for the club. Doncaster had the better of the second half and with nine minutes left, they forced a penalty of their own. Alex Winter, the used culprit. In contrast to Porter's spot kick, Tyson was clinical in making the game safe with his third goal in six games.
Four successive defeats had left Chesterfield's promotion push rather the worse for wear. They'd not lost five in a row for three and a half years. Ollie Banks kept out by a combination of Chris Maxwell and the bar. No coincidence the poor form has come since 25 goal Owen Doyle was sold to Cardiff. Filling his shoes, the on loan Keelan Lavery. He fired the spy rights in front. It was two before half time. Banks' his free kick wreaking havoc in the box. Defender Sam Hurd on hand to poke it home, provoking a Fleetwood inquest. One man doing too much talking was Anthony Sarsavik. Two rapid yellow cards for words out of turn. Too much for referee Pat Miller. There was no way back for the ten men. In fact, it only got worse. American Bolly Arayibi's composure, making the third for Sam Morsey. An impressive return to form for Chesterfield. Fleetwood boss Graham Alexander the next to cross the referee and be sent to the stand. His next problem to find somewhere to sit. Would you mind, awfully? Well, it was a, a non-event really today. Um, for a professional football game to be a professional football game, that means two teams are allowed to compete against each other. And that wasn't the case today. Lake Norrie stuck away three goals in winning at Chesterfield in their last away game. And on loan Swansea teenager Ryan Hedges set them on the way to another vital victory when he fired home the opener against Warsaw early in the second half. And three minutes later, Hedges turned creator for Chris Dagnall. Orient's top scorer hadn't found the net in six games, but he sealed the points on his 50th appearance for the East London club. Bottom of the table, Yeovil won 4-0 the last time they visited Glanford Park. They continued where they left off by taking the lead shortly before the half-hour mark. Gozi Ugwu's hard work down the left was eventually rewarded by Joel Grant, who was making his first start for four months. Deep into added time at the end of the first half, Byron Webster's foul on Paddy Madden gave Scunthorpe the chance to equalise. 35-year-old Gareth Stewart is usually giving advice to the Yeovil keepers, but after injury forced off Arta Krushak, the club's goalkeeping coach found himself facing former Glover's favourite Madden. The 19 months since his last appearance clearly hadn't affected his judgement. 16 minutes into the second half, Stewart was again called into action, but this time he couldn't keep out 18-year-old Hakib Adelakan's shot, which earned Scunthorpe a share of the points. The progress of Port Vale under Rob Page shows no sign of slowing. Suddenly the playoffs are a genuine target. A Magpies mix-up between Mike Edwards and Roy Carroll gave Mark Marshall a gift of an opener after only seven minutes. County's form before this game read just two wins in 15. Paddy McCourt's dribbling skills are well known as he carried the home team's fight. Chris Neal with a smart save. McCourt involved again in the second half as he set off on a run. Jamal Campbell-Rice kept out by Neal. Another win secured for Vale. Another mightily impressive defensive display. Three wins in a row, um, three clean sheets. Uh, a big performance that I've just said to him since I've taken over. I think that's the most complete performance that I've uh, that I've seen myself. You know, we, we knew we were going to be under under pressure in parts of the game, but um, I thought we defended ever so well, and we know that we got quality to our teams, which which proved um, right in the end. Whilst one unbeaten record may have gone, Burton were trying to preserve another one with Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank yet to taste defeat on home soil. Adam McGurk did almost everything right, but his luck was out as Newport counted their blessings. Their boss Jimmy Dack has just been given the job until the end of the season, so a positive result here would make his week. Mark Byrne got a sight of goal, but John McLaughlin was quick to cover his near post. Newport have just extended the loan spell of Miles Storey from Swindon, who just shy of the hour smashed in his first for the club to inflict back-to-back -back defeats on the leaders and lift his own team into the top seven. It's a massive win, uh, you know, uh, every win's a big win. Uh, to come to the top of the table side and, and get three points is, is a fantastic uh, thing for this football club, you know, but uh, you know we're delighted with the three points, we'll enjoy the weekend and then it's back to the drawing board again Tuesday. They were a little bit fresher and a little bit... Uh quicker and and they gave us problems uh, we were uh, a little bit unlucky hit the post you know and if if that goes in uh, the game opens up a little bit more 
Shrewsbury were putting the only unbeaten home record in the Football League on the line against one of the form sides in League Two. And having won six of their nine matches in 2015, it was hardly surprising to see Northampton take the lead after 20 minutes via the boot of Chris Hackett. Two minutes into the second half, the Cobblers caught the Shrews cold with a well-rehearsed free kick routine. Joel Byram sweeping the visitors two goals in front. Shrewsbury had gone 16 home league games without defeat and they weren't about to see it end here. Mickey Dimitriou's header six minutes from time gave them hope of keeping the record intact. But in the home side's desperation to get forward, Northampton had the chance to seal the win, only for Ricky Holmes to be denied by Jason Lutweiler. Nevertheless, the Cobblers had done enough to succeed where others had failed. It took us too long to get going and give away goals, two goals and give ourselves too much to do. Um, the, the, the law was fight and battle away, um, but uh, on the day it's, it's, it's been too late and when the chances have came along we haven't taken them. With goals in his previous two matches, it was no big surprise to see Fred Odjeinma make a fast start against Stevenage. And after he spurned a pretty decent early chance, he made amends in the next Wickham attack. Released in behind by Paul Hayes, he showed delightful presence of mind to roll his side in front. But just before the half-hour mark, a borough were level. Tom Pett timing his run superbly to meet the cross from Chris Welpdale. The midfielder's fourth in his last seven appearances. And deep into first half stoppage time, Dean Parrott's free kick sneaked through to give Stevenage the lead. But when you've got a poacher in form, you've always got a chance. And a far post on Yedinma header brought the scores level at 2-2, with 19 minutes still to play. Now it was anybody's game. But Wickham were big favourites after Chris Beardsley picked up a second yellow for coming together with Saido Giambate. The Stevenage strikers seemed to be looking at the ball, but the ref obviously felt it was a deliberate foul. Still, the ten men could have grabbed all three points eight minutes into stoppage time. Alfie Mawson hauling over Ben Kennedy to concede a penalty, but the young Wickham keeper Matt Ingram produced a terrific one-handed save to shut out Parrott. We've got out of jail at the end. Um, I'm not sure Stevenage would have deserved the win today, uh, but we... In my opinion, we've got the best keeper in the league in, uh, in goal, and he's, uh, he's, he's pulled out a, a brilliant penalty save. After upsetting Burton, Luton were next on Accrington's hit list. Stanley enjoying a purple patch with 10 points from 12. Terry Gonell and Josh Windass in quick succession, underlining that their promotion-chasing opponents would be wise to take nothing for granted. It took Luton time to settle, but as the half wore on, John Steele's side began to turn the screw. Scott Davis forced into a smart save by Elliot Lee. And the home club got a grip on the match four minutes before the break. Jaden Stockley's header couldn't be stopped. The Hatters hopeful of getting back in the winning habit after a pair of away defeats that had stalled their assault on a top three spot. That mission accomplished when Lee was allowed the time to tee up Luke Guttridge. The Luton players' reaction to their recent blip, just what their veteran boss wanted to see. We're all going to drop points. Just got to keep your nerve and keep going and be positive and be strong and um, see if you can get as many points as you can. But for large parts, we had the lion's share. We made the better chances and we were the better team. Um, on another day, we would have won it. We, we can't get too downhearted. You just got to dust yourself down and go again. A collapse at Stevenage last week led to seven days of what Phil Brown called soul searching at South End. But the Shrimpers always look set for their first win in three once Michael Timlin connected with this peach of a volley. Timlin also helped create the match clinching goal. His cross was nodded down by David Worrell and Barry Corr secured a victory. They put Southend back in the hunt for the top three. Troy Archibald Henville brought a fine save out of Ted Smith, but it was hard to disguise another difficult day for Carlisle. After a fourth straight defeat, the Cumbrians drop into the relegation zone. We play some good teams, uh, Luton, Shrewsbury, Wickham, uh, and then today side then good teams. They're up there for a reason, uh, and likewise um, we're, the, we're at the other uh, the other end of the table, and, uh, and there's reasons why. But uh, we're working on it. There's work in progress, and uh, there's a, there's, a, there's a fighting spirit that's in that changing room. You know, we've now won seven or eight at home, which is is not bad. But with, with seven six games to go at home, it roots all. So I've always said it: home form will get you promotion. All you know. 
bearing in mind we've won eight away from home, so you put the two of them together, it's a no-brainer that you win your home games, we're going to be somewhere near. At kick-off, these clubs occupied the last two playoff positions. Berry carved out the better opportunities and could have been in front when Nicky Adams found Daniel Nardiello, but the striker lofted his attempt over the top. Plymouth were chasing a fifth successive win. It would have been their best sequence of results for eight seasons. Their skipper Curtis Nelson saw a header come back off the bar. And the visitors, who this week moved into Manchester City's former training base at Carrington, grabbed the lead courtesy of the Adams-Nardiello combination. That's 13 for the season in all competitions for Nardiello. The Shakers' top scorer was then replaced by Danny Rose, and in the 90th minute, the 21-year-old got behind the Argyle defence and wrapped up the victory. That's three wins in a row for David Flitcroft's team. Great result, great performance. You know, first half completely controlled and dominated the proceedings against you know real strong, athletic Plymouth side. Um, first half, the control we had was was outstanding without really the finishing touch. Second half probably didn't have as much control or dominance, but you know the two uh, two goals were fantastic and probably come at the right times in the game for us. AFC Wimbledon still harbour hopes of making the playoffs and we're looking to exploit the Football League's bottom club to do so. Adi Oshilaj's 18th minute header almost set them on their way. If that was one of the few highlights of the first half, this was certainly the low point of the second. While the challenge by David Winfield was a firm but fair one, Michael Wood's afternoon was ended by what Hartlepool fear is a serious ankle injury. With 17 minutes left, Poole's emotions went from concern to joy as debutant Ryan Bird secured them an important three points in their bid to avoid relegation. Two wins out of three had reignited Morecambe's hopes of a playoff push, whilst Cambridge's winless streak was threatening to run into double figures. Ryan Donaldson ensured they'd be the ones heading to the break with a spring in their step, diving in bravely to meet Richard Tate's cross. Just as they had done in the first half, Morecambe started brightly in the second. Only the brilliant reflexes of use keeper Chris Dunn prevented Ryan Williams from restoring parity. The true value of that fine save would be known soon after, as Richard Money's men stretched their lead. Matt Harold hooking the ball into the path of Jordan Slew, who kept his composure to poke home his first for the club. A hammer blow for Morecambe boss Jim Bentley, who challenged his team to win back-to-back -back games for the first time since August. But after brushing Newport aside in their last outing, this was only heading one way. Andrew Fleming missed a chance to pull one back, but this was Cambridge's first win since hosting Manchester United in the FA Cup. Portsmouth fans rolled up expecting a thrill a minute. 13 goals in the club's previous two games, nine of them for Pompey. After a fabulous ball from Jeb Wallace picked out Matt Tubbs, they were mighty close to celebrating another. Instead, Oxford keeper Ryan Clark deserved the plaudits as his team held firm throughout. The U's remained too close to the bottom two for comfort, but it could have been worse. Wallace almost snatched Pompey a fourth successive win. Even with that single point, Andy Orford's men are up into the top half for the first time since November. Both these clubs were seeking some redemption after defeats the previous week. Exeter, who'd made four changes from the side beaten by Plymouth, had efforts from Liam Serkham and Clinton Morrison beaten away by keeper Bobby Olesnik while Alex Nichols' goal-bound shot was blocked on the line by Stefan Zubar. After appearing for Italy under-20s in midweek, Diego de Girolamo was back at York, and his pass gave Wes Fletcher a sight of goal. But Grecian's keeper James Haymon stood firm as it finished goalless. Only bottom club Hartlepool have scored fewer goals than Mansfield Town. And Jack Thomas squandered a golden chance at the far post to give his side the lead against Dagenham. But the home fans didn't have to wait long for a goal after the break. The lively junior Brown released on the right by Reggie Lamb. And when the ball came back off keeper Mark Cousins, Lamb was on hand to put Mansfield in front. The Daggers, though, have become much sharper going forward in recent weeks. And they put together a superbly worked equaliser. Top scorer Jamie Curitan finishing in typical style and needs just one more now to rack up 250 career league goals. 
but Mansfield just four points above the drop zone ahead of kickoff. Fired the winner eight minutes from time. Brown's instinctive finish meant they'd amassed ten points from their last four home games. Tranmere have been making a habit of losing to their fellow strugglers. A win at Wadden Road would have seen Rovers pull away from the bottom three, but they were always chasing the game at Cheltenham after Denny Holmes' seventh-minute own goal. Mickey Adams was scathing about his side's performance, but Tranmere could have levelled in the second half. Jordan Huggill had Trevor Carson beaten, but Matt Taylor preserved the clean sheet. That gave the Robins the platform to record only a second win in 18 games and their first under caretaker manager Russell Milton. Troy Brown settled it as Cheltenham climbed out of the relegation zone. Tranmere slipped closer to it. Max Powers near miss was the final disappointment in Rovers' fourth defeat out of six. Just gave him one word, winners lads, I want winners. And um, clean sheet, 2-0. Uh, the spirit, effort, determination was first class from start to finish. I think they knew the importance of the game. But we got exactly what we deserved, nothing. So uh, we've got to pick ourselves up and move on again. Well, Derby remain top of the Skybet Championship despite their first defeat in eight. And with Borough also losing, Watford with the big movers of the day, jumping three places to third. It's their highest position since early November. With three massive six-pointers at the foot of the table, it was a bad day for the likes of Millwall and bottom club Blackpool. The Seasiders are now 15 points from safety, while the Lions' late defeat at Rotherham leaves them six points behind the Millers. Birmingham's first win in nine moves them four places to 13th. Bristol City move eight points clear at the top of League One, with MK Dons losing three of the last five. Preston are up to third after a stunning February with five wins in five without conceding. The only side in the bottom six at the start of the weekend to lose was Colchester, who dropped back into the relegation zone. Managerless Coventry picked up their first win in eight to move out of the bottom four, while Aiden Orient's recent revival continues. A third win in four moves them to within a point of safety. None of the top three in League Two could manage a win, which included surprise home defeats for Burton and Shrewsbury. Luton now move to within two points of the automatic promotion places after extending their own 14-match unbeaten home run. The bottom two at the start of the weekend, both won, which means Hartlepool are now only six points adrift of safety, while Cheltenham jumped two places to 21st thanks to their first clean sheet in 27. Carlisle, meanwhile, dropping into the relegation zone after a fourth straight defeat. Well, that's it from us, but I'll be back on Sunday night for all the drama from Wembley and for what promises to be a terrific occasion as Chelsea take on Spurs in the League Cup final. That starts at 11.35 on BBC One. Well, Leroy, Gary, great to have you in. Thank you too for your company. We hope to see you soon. Bye for now.